Good evening, everyone. We continue our study in the book of Jeremiah. We are now in Jeremiah chapter 31. As we have indicated yesterday, the series of chapters from 30 to 34 are prophecies of hope that is to counter all the doom and gloom of the impending trials of the exile for the Israelites. In chapter 31, yesterday, we actually completed verse 1 because verse 1 is part and parcel of chapter 30. At the end of chapter 30, God repeats, at the same time, I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they shall be my people. And this refers to all the 12 tribes of Israel. We continue from verse 2. It says, Thus says the Lord, The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness, Israel, when I went to give him rest. Now, all of these are words of comfort to Israel and then to Judah. It is something that we need to pay attention and then we'll see that the first portion refers to the northern kingdom and then the small portion towards the end refers to Judah. And chapter 31 refers to both the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Please bear in mind that these two houses stem from after the United Kingdom of David and Solomon and thereafter was split into two. So the people who escaped the sword, there were many swords that came after the Israelites. We have the Egyptians, the Amalekites, the Canaanites, the, uh, the Assyrians, and then later on, the Babylonians. Now we see this, the word grace, hen, uh, we need to remember this is the word favor. Now please bear in mind, just as in good and evil that is seen from the eyes of the beholder, favor or grace is also seen from the eyes of the beholder. Many of these such situations uh, need to be understood that there are two parties involved. In this case, we have the people, and by the people, uh, these would be the ones that God is referring to as my people. And then they found hand in the wilderness, and these people is Israel, as Israel, that God will want to give them a resting place. Now, this is something that I think we need to understand, that God wants to literally give him rest, or give him a resting place, or place of tranquility, right? A place of tranquility. Now, by this, we should then realize that it keeps referring back to the land of Israel, right? For the land of Israel. We go to verse 3. God continues to say, The Lord has appeared or has allowed him to be seen from long ago, from of old, will be long ago. To me, to say, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love and therefore with loving kindness, I have drawn you. 
Uh, it says, again, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt. O virgin of Israel, you shall again be adorned with your tambourines and shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. You shall yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and eat them as ordinary food. Now, as we look at all these, it is really with refer referring to Israel, the northern kingdom. And by the northern kingdom, we need to understand it was Israel. And then it split into Israel and Judah. So Judah was really the smaller of the two. And so Israel sometimes is referred to the northern kingdom and sometimes referred to the unified kingdom. And here it talks about the... The, 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 the time when Israel was part of unified Israel, God showed him and then God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, a love that is olam. Remember, olam is not everlasting, a long-term love. Now, by love, we also should understand this word love is ahav. This is ahav. And by ahav, uh, you will find that this would mean something that you give, you provide, and you provision. That's the idea of love, right? Ahav, an everlasting ahav. Uh, ahav uh, olam. Uh, and, and by this, you need to understand that this is not the modern construct of love uh, as a man love a woman. Uh, but the idea here is that God loved Israel to protect Israel. Uh, and, and as time went on, God continued to provide for Israel. And this provision and protection and the giving of the land to Israel demonstrates the love of God for Israel. It says, therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And God uses a, a second word. Uh, this is chesed. And that would be loving kindness as entreating one that is in a relationship. So God is demonstrating that he has a relationship with Israel and also the house of Israel. Now it says again, I will build you, which means that God built them, but they are no longer built. And so you shall be rebuilt. That, that is the whole idea. Now understand this. Build and rebuild comes from the same word. And so it's in context that we want to look at the word. And so Israel was, this, uh, was there, went into the promised land. Although kingdom split, it's still Israel. And then they were destroyed. And God says, you shall be rebuilt, means sometime in the future. So they are not rebuilt yet. And Israel is referred to as the virgin of Israel, as someone who is, whom God is proud of. And we are looking at it from a future. So it says, you shall again be adorned with tambourines, go for the dances of those who rejoice. These would reflect on a time when there is celebration. And God is saying, in the future, you will celebrate again. You will come back to the mountains of Samaria and plant vines and you will eat them as food because they are no longer in the land. Now, when we talk about Samaria and Ephraim, we're always talking about the northern kingdom. So you should know that we have Judah and then Samaria which is part of Ephraim, 
and further up north will be Galilee. That's how we would construct this. And so the northern part, north of Judah, will be the house of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, which is the northern part. Continuing in verse 6, For there shall be a day when the watchman will cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. All of these is speaking of location. This is in north of Judah. In Israel, Zion is Jerusalem, which means that there will be a coming up point in time where they will move from the north and go to assemble in Jerusalem. And to the Lord our God will also imply that this is a temple where they will congregate and serve God. We look at verse 7. It says, For thus says the Lord. It says, All of these is to do with celebration when they come back to the land in the future. Sing with gladness with Jacob. Shout among the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. I want us to remember God, and this will be Jehovah, is seen to be the Savior. And now in verse 7, the idea of Savior is somebody who will deliver them from the predicament that they're in, in exile, uh, primarily, your people and Whenever they talk about the exile coming back, uh, oftentimes we, we fail to see it's not every single individual, but particularly the remnant of Israel, which refers to the faithful remnant. The unfaithful remnant is not interesting to God. And so today in the land of Israel, there are both faithful and uh, secular. And so the idea here is one day when all these things are to be fulfilled, we will have to witness the faithful remnant that will come back from all over the place. It says here, Behold, I, and it's God who will bring them from the north country, the land from the north, and gather them from the ends of the earth, and the blind, the lame, the woman with child, or the pregnant woman, the one who is laboring with child, all together, a great throng shall return there. And by there, it, it means the land. It is always about the land. They will come back. But what is important in verse 8, is the idea of God is the one who will cause them to come back. The, the subject or the, the originator of the mass return is actually God. So it is not such that we see how things are happening. You will have to see God, God's hand in those events because they are calling out to God to save them, deliver their people, Israel in this case, the northern kingdom, to come back. Everyone will come back, but we're talking about the faithful remnant. It continues, they shall come with weeping and with supplications. I, God, will lead them. I, God, will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Now, we need to explain this a little bit. In verse 9, when he talks about Israel and Ephraim, 
we're both talking about the northern kingdom. And so the name Ephraim is the lead tribe of the northern ten tribes. And Israel is seen as a firstborn. And since Israel is seen as a firstborn, Ephraim represents the tribe of the northern kingdom Israel. Now, let me just refresh everybody's memory. There was Israel, and Israel is the firstborn. And when it's split, it is still called Israel. But there is a second smaller one called Judah. And Judah is seen as the, uh, 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 from is because of David that Judah exists. And Israel is the one that God will see as the bigger nation and the first nation to be destroyed, the first nation to be taken into exile, taken into dispersion. So God is also referring to Israel as firstborn and by uh, extension Israel is said to be the firstborn and Ephraim is another name for Israel when it is in the split kingdom says here hear the word of the Lord O nations and in verse 10 O nations would be Goyim. This is the Goyim, where Israel is dispersed and declare it in the isles far off and say. Now, this is what isles far off. Uh, I guess we should we should see this uh, as the islands that is afar off. It says he, God, who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd does his flock to bring them together again. So understand, we are still talking about Israel. It will be Israel here and Israel here. That both are seen by God as the same. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob, the other name of Israel, and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. The idea of ransom, remember, uh, this is really to deliver and restore back to its original. Restore to original, to original ownership. You can see that um, when they were dispersed, they are out of the hand of God. And when God says, I will redeem you and then I will bring you back, these both, the, both words are the same. Same idea to bring back to where God now owns them. Continue in verse 12. Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming to the goodness of Jehovah. For wheat and new wine and oil, these are all celebratory foods. For the young of the flock and the herd, their souls shall be like a well-watered garden and they shall sorrow no more at all. Please understand when you read this, no more at all means they are in sorrow now. That's why chapter 30, 31 today, it's a prophecy of hope that while they are in sorrow, they can think about the future where they can talk about going back to the good old days in the land of Israel. Again, we are reading this as a prophetic word of hope. Then and then shall the virgin rejoice and dance the young men together and the old, for I will turn their mourning to joy. I will comfort them I will make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I will satiate the soul of the priest with abundance and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. All of these is talking about the good old days in the kingdom of David and Solomon, that all these will be celebration 
rejoicing. And so their mourning would be when now they are in sorrow, it will turn to joy because they will be back in the land. God will comfort them and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. Verse 13, sorrow here literally means grief. Why? Because this is now. The joy will be later. The comfort will be later. The rejoicing will be later. And in those days that is coming, God says, I will sashay the soul of the priest. Now remember, when he talks about sashay the soul of the priest with abundance, it is talking about sacrifices that will once again happen in the temple. And the priest will get the share of the sacrifices to eat. And that is what it means to sashay the soul of the priest with the fatness, with abundance. My, and this idea of sashay means they, they have so much to eat. And my people shall be satisfied with my goodness. And by goodness... It literally means with my best. Now, good, right? it's in the form of good. Good and evil is seen in the eyes of God. When it says my goodness, means God looks at all this and gives them what God considers is very good to God, which also means in turn will be very good to the people. That would be how God is giving them hope. Now you suffer, now in sorrow, but one day all will come back and your mourning will turn to joy. Verse 15, thus says the Lord. Now all these words are talking about the trouble that they are in. A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. This is a time where they remember they are not in the land. They are suffering. They are mourning. And all these time of exile is not a time where they can say that they are enjoying themselves. This whole idea is, is that you, you need to understand that they are at a time where they are not in their own land and they are far away, they are dispersed, they have no peace. But God is giving them the hope. Thus says the Lord. Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. As you can see now, this is the now, and this will be the future. The hope that they will come back from where they are. And God continues to say this, that there is Hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. This is not in their generation. So it is not. So it's talking about your children, not you will come back. And so all these are little words that will describe the details. The details is that their children. Now, how far down, we don't know. But we know for a fact that it is not in that generation. And in chapter 29, God already said, you'll be away for at least 70 years. So have children and, 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 uh, and be permanent in that place. But now we are not told how many generations down. As far as we can tell, they are still not back yet. 
I, God, have surely heard Ephraim, the northern kingdom, bemoaning himself. You have chastised me, and I was chastised. Now remember, God is disciplining them. And yesterday we saw that although the enemies in the foreign land will come to an end, but the nation of Israel will not come to an end. They are considered in the state of being chastised like an untrained bull to teach them to become useful again. And so in verse 18, it says, Restore me, return me, cause me to return, and I will return. So this idea uh, of restore is actually the idea of return. Return, cause me to return, and I will return. That in the future, when God says it's time, they will come back. For you are the Lord my God. They will realize that it's time to go back because they have done wrong. 19. Surely after my return. See, these are all the same words. In the English, they have used three words. As you can see here, it is restore, return, and turning. They are the same words. And then you will find in verse 19, uh, this word repented, by the way, is not return. This word is nakam. These other words is shuv, which is for repent. But this word repented shouldn't be used. It should be nakam. I relented. Realize that the, the they what they did was wrong, and now they changed and turned back. And that is the idea of relent. It's a disappointment, and now they change and turn back to God. And he says, after I was instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. It's like well, when you realize that you have done wrong, you beat yourself. I was ashamed, yes, even humiliated because I bore the reproach of my youth. Which means that in the latter days, the northern kingdom will realize that they have been so wrong. Verse 20, Ephraim, my dear son, is Ephraim a son who is dear to me, a son who is pleasant? Now, these statements is, is a bit different. So let me just give you the alternative rendition. Ephraim, my favorite son is he a delightful child God is treating Israel or the northern kingdom like a little child for though I spoke against him I earnestly remember him still therefore my heart yearns for him and I surely have mercy on him says the Lord the way that God addresses Ephraim is like a, a child that God loves so much, but he has to punish him. But still God pines for him and wants him to come back. That, that is the way that verse 20 is expressed. Set up signposts, make landmarks, set your heart toward the highway. All these are words and of imagery that says, be prepared to come back. The way in which you went, where you left, turn back, O virgin of Israel, the northern country. Turn back to these, your cities. All this is an imagery to return. Verse 22. Verse 22 says, how long will you 
gad about. Now, this word is very strange. The English word is not what we're used to. This word gad is slip away. Or in this case, cause yourself, cause yourself to drift away. It says, oh, backsliding daughter. So the idea of backsliding here uh, gives us a whole picture of, of turning away, moving away from God. Uh, so that, that would be the picture here as backsliding. That a person who used to walk in the path of God not only leaves the path, but goes back. And so this is called backsliding. For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. Now this word new we need to talk about. A woman shall encompass a man. Now this is a very strange uh, expression. It says, For the Lord has created a new thing. Has made a new thing. Now new would be renew. Refresh. Not new as never happened before. Right? It's a refresh that a woman shall, this word encompass means to go after. To go after a man. To turn towards a man. To court a man. And God wants them in the latter days as they turn back to God to chase after God. And so this would be an imagery of uh, the, the woman, Israel, chasing after God, the man. So it is in a poetic language to talk about the, the fact that Israel needs to then go after God in a faithful manner. Now we have a number of verses to carry on from verse 23. I would like to take a break here at verse 22 so that we can carry on and finish chapter 31 because there are a number of key elements in this second portion that we need to spend time on to unpack and so that all of us can have a clear understanding of the rest of chapter 31. And so with this, we come to the end of our session today.